So just to be sure. So Kevin, you are recording, right? Yes, I'm recording. Okay, cool, uh, perfect. Thank you. Yes, it says there. All right. So why don't we go? Because let's see. Yeah. So we're recording. We're open. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started today with our VMAX. So thanks to everybody who is joining us. Uh, our instructions in the chat, the most important one is if you have questions while the speakers are going, put it in the Q&A and either you'll get those, you'll get those answered at some point, um, either during the talk or afterwards. And uh, what we're going to do is have the short 10 minute talk. There won't be Q&A after that, so use the Q&A function. And then we'll have the longer 40 minute talk and a 10 minute Q&A after that. And if you still want to keep going, I put in the chat, the Zoom room, that'll be a smaller discussion afterwards for like a half an hour or how long it takes. Okay, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So we have Baxter Robinson, who is going to kick us off with a short presentation today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia. I really appreciate being included in the program to talk today about entrepreneurship and incomplete markets. Uh, so entrepreneurial decisions have aggregate implications. In the US, privately held firms account for almost 70% of the private sector labor force. And of the 11% of US households with at least one entrepreneur in them, these households are own 40% of aggregate wealth. Given this, understanding the challenges and barriers that entrepreneurship face can help us understand what the aggregate implications of entrepreneurial decisions are. One key challenge that entrepreneurs face is that they face a high degree of uninsurable business risk. We know that the majority of new businesses exit within the first five years of operation, and that even conditional on survival, entrepreneurial earnings are much more volatile than employment earnings. So in this paper, I'm going to ask the question, what are the macroeconomic implications of the uninsurable nature of entrepreneurial risk in the US economy? To do this, I build a model of risky entrepreneurship that features two distinct financial frictions. The first is a missing market for entrepreneurial risk that prevents individuals from insuring across different states of the world where their business is successful versus where their business is unsuccessful. And in studying this friction, I'm going to make my main contribution. I'm going to study how this missing market for entrepreneurial risk distorts individual decisions and what are the aggregate implications for productivity, output, and the distribution of wealth. There's a uh, an existing literature studying how borrowing constraints impact entrepreneurial decisions and their implications for aggregate output, uh, productivity, and the distribution of wealth. So I'm also including borrowing constraints here. And then faced with these two financial frictions, I, in the model, individuals are going to choose to be either workers or entrepreneurs. Conditional on being an entrepreneur, individuals are going to choose from a menu of different risky projects with higher risk projects leading to higher expected productivity. I use micro data on new US firms to discipline the strength of the financial frictions and to validate some of the model's predictions. Then I do a quantitative analysis where I'm gonna shut down this missing market for risk by completing the market and see what happens to entrepreneurs' decisions and aggregate uh, outcomes and then do the same for the borrowing constraints. I then finish the paper with a simple policy analysis. What are my key findings? Well, first, for aggregate productivity, I find that completing the missing market for risk in my model increases aggregate productivity by 9%. This is twice as much as when I relax the borrowing constraints. Aggregate productivity increases by 4%. I also find that when I complete the missing market for risk, this is going to substantially reduce wealth inequality. So the share of wealth owned by the wealthiest 1% drops from 28% in the benchmark economy to 9% when I complete the missing market for risk. This means that I have an equity efficiency win-win here where completing the missing market increases aggregate productivity and reduces wealth inequality. By contrast, when I relax the borrowing constraints, this is gonna increase wealth inequality, so we have a traditional equity efficiency trade-off. 
in the final policy analysis part of the paper, I consider a simple partial insurance scheme for entrepreneurs that is successful at increasing aggregate output by 8% in the model. I start this paper with a number of motivating facts from the Kaufman firm survey. So this is a single cohort panel of about 5,000 new US firms that all start in 2004. I don't have time today to go through all of the motivating facts, but I'm gonna talk you through this one graph. So on the x-axis of this graph, I have ranked firms into 10 deciles by how much money the entrepreneurs are investing in their own businesses from their own personal finances. And then on the vertical axis, I'm calculating a return on equity for each firm, an average return over the sample period, and then calculating the coefficient of variation for uh, each decile of firms. What I find is that firms which have larger investments by the owners also have more dispersed outcomes in terms of the return on equity. This is gonna motivate thinking about entrepreneurs choosing between different risky types of businesses. So based on this fact and uh, several others that you'll have to see in the paper, I build a model uh, where individuals have a certain level of entrepreneurial ability, a certain amount of worker ability, and a certain amount of the financial asset. Based on these three things, they're gonna choose each period to be either a worker or an entrepreneur. And conditional on being an entrepreneur, they're going to choose how much capital to invest in, where capital is subject to a liquidation cost, and they're going to choose a level of business risk from this menu of different risky options with higher, ex higher risk projects leading to higher expected productivity. Individuals in the model face two distinct financial frictions. This missing market for risk, which means that there's no state contingent insurance available and borrowing constraints, which means that entrepreneurs can only borrow a portion of the capital stock. I'm then gonna take a, a panel of new firms from the model and calibrate them so that they match certain features of the Kaufman firm survey data. What are the main mechanisms in this paper? Well, both financial frictions are gonna distort the choices that individuals face. The missing market for entrepreneurial risk is gonna discourage individuals from starting higher risk, higher expected productivity businesses. It's gonna discourage individuals from investing in a large amount of capital. And it's gonna discourage individuals from selecting into entrepreneurship relative to being a worker. Um, the borrowing constraints are gonna limit how much capital individuals are able to invest in. And by limiting how much entrepreneurial income they can earn, it's gonna discourage people from selecting into entrepreneurship as well. Wealth plays a really important role in this model in allowing individuals to overcome both of these financial frictions. And it allows them to self-insure against the idiosyncratic risk they face. And it allows them to self-finance a larger capital stock. The main quantitative exercise that I do is to complete the missing market for risk by adding in state contingent assets at actuarially fair prices. When I do this, I find that aggregate productivity increases by 9% as entrepreneurs switch to higher risk, higher expected productivity projects. I also find that wealth inequality falls both from a direct insurance effect, as well as the fact that now lower wealth individuals are willing to start these higher risk, higher expected productivity projects. And so on average, earn higher rates of return than in the benchmark economy. To contrast that, that exercise with the more commonly done exercise in the literature, I then relax the borrowing constraints and allow individuals to invest in any amount of capital while keeping the market for risk missing. I find here that aggregate productivity increases by 4% as formerly constrained entrepreneurs invest in a lot more capital and high ability wealth poor individuals become entrepreneurs. I also find that wealth inequality rises. These quantitative exercises, of course, compare the benchmark economy to a world where we can either perfectly complete the market or perfectly uh, relax these borrowing constraints. So given that that's unrealistic, I want to think about policies. So the, the quantitative exercise demonstrate that this missing market for entrepreneurial risk distorts entrepreneurs' decisions in the model and reduces aggregate output and productivity. 
actually We'd want three, three minutes, okay? Wonderful, thanks. We want to provide more insurance to these entrepreneurs in order to encourage them to take on these riskier, higher expected productivity projects. But this market is missing because of real adverse selection and moral hazard problems. So the question that I ask is, can governments provide more insurance to entrepreneurs in the presence of adverse selection? I consider an unemployment-like benefit for unsuccessful entrepreneurs that takes the form of a government transfer that tops up individuals, uh, entrepreneurs' incomes to a certain lower threshold Y lower bar. And I'm gonna finance these transfers with a proportional tax on entrepreneurial profits. Uh, here on this graph, on the x-axis, I'm showing the size of this, on, uh, this, this entrepreneurial income threshold, y lower bar. And on the vertical axis, I'm showing the aggregate output in the economy. What you can see is that at low levels of this benefit, this is very successful at encouraging individuals to select higher risk, higher expected productivity projects, improving the distribution of firm productivities in the economy, aggregate productivity, and therefore output. But at high levels of this benefit, adverse selection swamps these, uh, these positive effects. So that lower ability individuals are now selecting into entrepreneurship, not because they expect to make any money as entrepreneurs, but simply because these unemployment-like benefits of entrepreneurship exceed their labor market opportunity cost. Um, so in summary, I study the macroeconomic implications of uninsurable entrepreneurial risk. I build a model of occupational choice and entrepreneurial risk choice, which I discipline using micro data on new US firms. I find that completing the market, missing market for risk is twice as important for aggregate productivity as relaxing the borrowing constraints, and that completing the missing market for risk reduces wealth inequality. I argue that there are potentially large returns to providing additional insurance for entrepreneurs if we can get around the adverse selection and moral hazard pro uh, problems with well-designed policy. Uh, excited to see any questions in the chat, or please feel free to send me an email. My email is on the screen. Thank you so much for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Baxter. That was really interesting. And you got your policy experiment here recently, since we've given extended unemployment insurance benefits to self-proprietors. So, OK, exactly. all right. Very good. Now we're going to move on to our longer presentation today. and. Florin B.O.B. is going to be presenting. So Florin, take it away. Hi, uh, thank you all for, for being here. And thank you to the organizers for selecting this. We're really uh, grateful and honored. And when I say we, uh, this is a, a joint paper with Mark Mellet who is in the uh, chat and who can answer some of your questions and then we can also talk after. So this is the title of the paper, but let me just go to uh, what we do. Let me tell you in a second what we do. Uh, so this is a paper about entry and exit and its role in uh, you know, business cycles in general, but in particular with an application to the COVID-19 recession, where I guess, uh, everybody's pretty much convinced that the entry and exit are, are kind of central to this, both from a supply perspective, which is that some firms uh, are closing down and some are entering, as we'll see in a second, and, and from a demand perspective in that some varieties are simply not available anymore temporarily or maybe forever. And we're going to cover some evidence for this. And this kind of, uh, the, the kind of things that we talk about here have been sort of on our research agenda for almost two decades, in particular in joint work with uh, Fabio Gironi, to whom, of course, this, this whole project uh, owes a lot of credit. And of course, there are many other people working on this. And what we're gonna do here is to kind of use, build on some of that theory in order to address kind of the first thing, which is the COVID-19 recession. And, you know, everybody who worked in models with entry and exit and business cycles know that data is really an issue here. And, you know, data is, is not even clear what data you need, what le level of disaggregation, what uh, frequency, uh, and so on and so forth. There are many kind of subtle issues, and we talked about some of those in our previous work. But I think 
uh, one thing that we see in the current crisis is that people understood that finally you kind of need, you really need good data. And we see some examples of, of kind of trying to fix this entry exit the business. One of them is, uh, is this uh, is data from Opportunity Insights, but actually the data is from Womply. It's just so it's available on, on this website. And this plots here, this is about exit, the exit margin. And this is in particular about small businesses and this plots of small businesses that were open uh, in the COVID-19 recession. And you see in the beginning, we were kind of at some level, then 40% of them closed down. This is a gross exit, right? This is just the firms, uh, uh, small businesses closing down and then like 10, 15% reopen. But right now, so this has been updated the day before yesterday, we're still like one third of small businesses are still, still closed. And this is corroborated by evidence from this paper uh, that I really recommend to everyone about Crane, Decker, et al. And Ryan uh, Decker helped us a lot navigate this, this data uh, that is corroborated by data from, from Homebase, which is another data set. So, you know, there's been like a lot of exit and I guess it's not surprising. Now, what about entry? And I have to say that it's, it's almost one year on the clock that John Heltiwanger posted this data that showed that there's been a huge decrease in, in entry measured by business applications in the US. And now this, this data is available actually on FRED. So this is weekly data from the census. And these are business applications uh, without distinguishing whether they are you know, with wages, without wages, et cetera. And John has a fascinating paper about that that's more on the empirical side. We're just kind of trying to use this kind of stylized fact in order to inform our theoretical exercise. So here, what John uh, showed first was that uh, what I'm plotting here is business applications changing the number of business applications. Okay, so there's been a huge fall in the number of business applications, one measure of entry. And this is in percentage is like 40%. And, you know, we thought, wow, this is big. Now people will really be convinced that entry has, is, you know, is and this kind of persisted uh, for like throughout the, the spring. Uh, and then it kind of recovered. And the really shocking thing was that during the summer and then in the, in the autumn, and then it didn't really stop. There's been a massive increase in entry. Of course, some of this has to do with reallocation. And there's a lot of discussion about this increase in entrepreneurship and pivoting and what have you. It's not clear how much of this will actually uh, pan out and survive and transform into real innovation. So these are all things that are kind of happening as we speak. But you know, there's been this massive increase in entry and this is unlike anything that you've ever seen before. There were fluctuations before, a blip every now and then, but you know, this is like huge compared to the previous thing. Now, so remember this big fall in entry, but then kind of this huge recovery. But if now you look at uh, a measure of aggregate activity, of course, GDP is one of these other things that we don't see in real time, but there is this uh, weekly economic indicator that, that you can look at by Lewis Mertens and Stock. And you can see that, I mean, everybody knows this picture, this recession of like 12, 12%, and then a recovery, it's like a slight recovery, but it's not really a recovery. If you think of this as being kind of fluctuating around potential, uh, and this fall is being a fall in output that's kind of more than potential. Of course, potential output is something uh, mysterious and very hard to measure if possible at all. That's a separate discussion. I guess most macroeconomists would agree that you know, not all of this is potential output. So some of it is actually a fall in the output gap. So, the, so, so output falls below potential. So a recession that's large and that's kind of persistent. Now, any model of entry and variety would tell you that when you have a recovery in entry, you would also have a recovery in, in aggregate activity. So, so bear, bear that in mind because that's not what we're gonna have. So of course, I mean, now there is, there is this fascinating paper that, that shows that in fact, this may even be understated because of precisely mechanisms like the ones that we're gonna talk about uh, today, which are that you're not accounting for all the varieties that disappeared. And if you were to account for those, CPI inflation would actually be higher and the recession would actually be double what, what, what you think it was. And so, so that, that's a separate discussion. So this is kind of the empirical uh, justification. It's just facts that we're gonna try to to kind of have a, a little bit in our model. So in our model, we're just 
going to build on a literature that, that we've worked on uh, without nominal rigidities and with nominal rigidities that looks at entry, exit, and, and uh, business cycles. And many others have, have worked on this, and this is a literature that was also you know, initiated in the 90s by, by several papers. And it, this will also be related to other papers that have looked at the COVID-19 recession, emphasizing related but different mechanisms that have to do more with like sectoral shocks and reallocations. And we're gonna explain, uh, I hope I'm gonna get there. Uh, we're gonna try to explain very kind of specifically how this is a very different that, uh, fr from, from those, those important contributions. And this is also related to the debate, those of you who, uh, were taught maybe when I was taught 20 years ago, remember this well, very heated debate about the, uh, the response of our work to TFP shocks and how it differs between the New Keynesian and RBC model. And we're gonna to speak to that literature uh, too. So what we do in this paper, where there are like two main contributions and then some, some kind of extensions. So the first one is what we call the entry exit multiplier which is that price stickiness amplifies the response of entry and exit to aggregate supply or to TFP shocks, okay? And it turns out that the multiplier in our benchmark is given by this theta, and this theta will be the elasticity of substitution between goods. And with monopolistic competition in a CS framework, this will have to be larger than one. And it turns out one is in fact the response of entry and exit to a TFP shock under flexible prices. So that's why we call it the multiplier because it's always larger than under flexible prices and the multiplier is given by this theta for reasons that will become clear in a second. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you will also have an amplification of aggregate activity as we will see in a second. So what we call aggregate demand amplification is that the response of output under sticky prices is gonna be larger than under flexible prices. That is to say the output gap will will respond in a way that's amplified. So take, for example, an aggregate supply disruption, a bad TFP shocks to, fi to fix ideas. So let's take this DA to be the negative increment in, in A, where A is TFP. And here in this table, we record, so it's gonna be important throughout this talk to distinguish between these four models, four cases. And the first one is, if you think of the standard model where there is no entry and exit, and you distinguish between flexible prices, kind of an RBC model with, flex, with a fixed capital, but flexible prices, and the model with sticky prices, it turns out when TFP goes down, think of C, consumption is equal to A times L, okay? Where A is TFP, L are hours worked. If hours worked are fixed for whatever reason, if TFP goes down by 1%, output and consumption goes, go down by 1%. So that's, you know, one, one to one here. It turns out with sticky prices, the response of output is actually smaller. The fall in output is actually smaller or is at most as large as under flexible prices. And this is a known property or problem, if you will, of, of the uh, New Keynesian model with sticky prices. And we're gonna come back to that and we're gonna explain where it comes from. It's related to the response of hours work. So that means that in response to a bad TFP shock, the response of output gap is positive, okay? so. That some of us think that's a little bit of a problem. Now in a model with endogenous entry and exit with flexible prices, like the models that we've written before with Fabio and many other, many other models, there is amplification in the sense that if you have a bad TFP shock, you have a larger response of output under flexible prices, but under sticky prices, and this is gonna be a contribution of this paper, it turns out that the response of output is gonna be much larger, potentially much larger than under flexible prices in absolute value. In other, and it's actually gonna be a function of the size of the shock, okay? So in other words, the response of the output gap will be negative to a negative TFP shock. Entry will, will completely flip this thing around, endogenous entry, I mean. Now, at the same time, the recovery in entry, so when you have a positive TFP shock, when you have a recovery in entry, that will come about without a, a, a recovery in aggregate activity, which is a little bit what we see in the data. And that's, and that's something that we're kind of uh, proud of our model to, to be able to deliver. And as a bonus, we're gonna do all this while at the same time uh, implying that the, the, the cyclicality of hours work to a TFP shock is the same between flexible and sticky prices, thus kind of solving a, a kind of dichotomy between the New Keynes and RBC model without entry. So the model is almost like embarrassingly simple. It's a very simple model. 
uh, but it's simple because we got to it being simple, starting from something more complicated and trying to kind of distill what were really the key mechanisms that, that deliver that, that key kind of ingredients that, that we need to, to, to deliver this, this finding. CS preferences, a consumption basket over uh, anti varieties, and this is going to be determined endogenously in equilibrium. Little city of omega is a consumption of the individual variety, theta is the elasticity of substitution between, between them, and it has to be larger than one with monopolistic competition. A CPI index, big P, is an integral of the small little p's uh, that are the individual prices, the standard uh, uh, CES uh, aggregator, and the individual demand for each good relative to the aggregate is gonna be a function of the relative price with demand elasticity a little theta. Okay, with the standard CS Dixie Stiglitz. Now, each variety is produced by a monopolist and is produced using only labor. And LT of omega is a labor for each variety. There is a fixed cost paid in efficiency labor units, if you will. And this is going to determine in equilibrium how many firms uh, produce through the zero profit condition that I'm going to get to in a second. But now, what I want to emphasize is our kind of metaphor for the COVID-19 recession will be a negative TFP shock. You can also think of it as part of the, as other papers have done, part of the labor uh, is, is unavailable huh? or something something like, you know, this, this AT that's an aggregate shock, it hits all firms in the same way, is gonna take a negative, uh, uh, an, uh, it, there's gonna be a negative innovation to it. Um, Okay, so in these models, a key object is a, is a benefit of variety, and we're going to denote it by this rho t, and this rho t, if you impose a symmetric equilibrium here in the CPI uh, index, is uh, the relative price of each individual variety relative to the, to the whole basket, and if you simply impose, you know, if you take the integral with identical prices here, you're going to see that this uh, little p over big p is n to the power of uh, theta minus one, and this is a standard variety effect that you have in all models of endogenous growth and trade and geography and everywhere where this is uh, really uh, a key. And this means what? If you have, uh, it's easier to satisfy the same level of demand if you add an additional good when you like variety and the elasticity of that is one over theta minus one, again, driven completely by theta. In the Dixie Stiglitz case, we're gonna deviate from this later. Or if you have a good that was not there, it has an infinite uh, shadow price, then when it's being introduced, it's gonna, that price is gonna become finite and then you have deflation in the, in the idealized price index and then you have inflation in relative prices, again, completely standard, Grossman, Heltman, uh, Romer, et cetera. So now the markup that each firm charges is gonna depend on, you know, are they uh, able to reset their prices or not? And I'm not getting into that yet, but this object is always well-defined. The markup is gonna be the relative price of that firm divided by the marginal cost. And since there is only labor, marginal cost, bear, bear this in mind, is just the wage divided by a TFP. And again, TFP is aggregate, is common to everybody. And now the profit function in real, in real terms, in units of the aggregate good, is this little dt is sales of the individual firm minus the wage cost of, of, of the firms. Now, since the equilibrium is symmetric and these firms are identical in all, in all respects, a free entry exit equilibrium is an equilibrium where uh, the aggregate profits aggregated across individual firms are zero, but because of symmetry, that means individual profits are zero. And this is simply going to pin down how many firms produce in equilibrium. Of course, we spent uh, all our previous papers saying you should actually be doing a different kind of free entry condition with some cost and then trade investment and so on. But it turns out this simplifies the algebra really a lot and it allows us to get some uh, nice, we think, analytics here. Why? Part of it is because if you now derive the aggregate economy resource constraint, you're going to have that consumption is equal to output. There is no investment. And on the income side, this is equal to the to the labor to, to the labor uh, to the wage bill, okay, to the total wage bill. So there are no profits. Profits are completely cleaned out by entry. So that that's going to simplify a lot of things because there's not going to be any kind of income effects from profits coming in. But now, if you take the individual production functions and you aggregate them, notice that with CES, this is when you aggregate this, 
these, uh, these individual production functions, you cannot just sum them up because that would amount to summing uh, apples and oranges. You need, to, uh, you need to multiply them by their relative price. So you need to take little rho times little c times n. Okay, it's not just c times n. So if you do that, what you get is an aggregate production function that, that, that is at the core of, again, growth and trade and so on, that says, you know, here you have the labor input of each individual firm, a net of the, net of the entry costs. And here you have something that looks a little bit like an endogenous productivity shifter. And that's just a variety. There's just a kind of returns to variety. And you see that it has an exponent and this exponent because theta is larger than one is larger than one. So the increasing returns to variety, if you will. And now of course, if you say that there are you know, increasing returns at the aggregate level, it means that the aggregate labor, labor demand is of course upward sloping. And, and not only is it upward sloping, it's also gonna be the way in which it shifts with TFP shocks is also amplified by these returns to variety. And this is, this is what explains amplification in a model with flexible prices, but in a model with sticky prices too, the way these models work is that labor demand shifts around because markups, the markup changes endogenous because firms cannot reset their prices. That's true in a model without variety, but that's also true in a model with variety and that will be key here because so the, the labor demand will shift. This is a model to close it now, you just need three more things. You need to say, how do households as, uh, choose labor supply, what's the pricing decision of firms, and what's kind of the aggregate demand side. Now to start with the last one, we're going to take in the, in the benchmark the simplest possible example of aggregate demand. We're going to assume a quantity equation, see, you know, uh, cash in advance or uh, money in the utility with log utility, whatever, money chosen by the central bank is equal to nominal expenditure, which is big P, the price of the, of the whole basket, times a big C. We generalize this then to a Euler equation and Taylor rule. And in fact, we prove an isomorphism in one special case in the paper. Now then what about price setting? We're gonna distinguish two polar cases. We're gonna distinguish one case where all firms can set their, reset their prices freely. And that's you know, the standard thing. And then the other polar case will be a case where no firm can reset their, its price uh, at all. Okay, so the fixed, the little P's are gonna be fixed. Firms enter, but at the entrance, uh, there is a little P bar that's written there and firms say, okay, I'm gonna have to produce at this price. This is not realistic in any possible way, but it's just to completely, you know, boost up this aggregate demand effect. And it is just, uh, it's a very standard thing that we've been using in this literature uh, uh, for a long time. It does a little bit more here because of the entry margin, because we keep the entry margin open, okay? So individual prices are fixed, but the entry margin is open and that will adjust in equilibrium. And then we're gonna generalize this to sticky prices, Rothenberg, et cetera. So of course there is a distinction here that's meaningful between the individual prices fixed, but the big P is gonna, is gonna, is gonna adjust because of the, the changes in the number of varieties. And that's of course gonna be key. And the last thing is labor supply. On the household side, we're gonna assume in the benchmark that utility is logarithmic. And this is important, why? Because if you take the labor supply equation of the household, it's gonna be the standard, the wage, divided by consumption because of log utilities, L to the power of phi, where phi is the inverse elasticity of labor supply. Now, if there are no profits at all, C is equal to WL, W drops out, okay? And then L will be, will be fixed. And L is fixed in equilibrium because income and substitution effect of the real wage changes, when the labor demand shifts, they're, they're, go they're gonna be offsetting income and substitution effects because of the log assumption. And that's gonna be true with entry. That's gonna be true without entry with flexible prices. That's not gonna be true with sticky prices. And that's of course at the core of how the New Keynesian model uh, uh, works, okay? So now with these assumptions, our, the, so the closed form solution of our four models looks like this. This is a standard uh, model and this is our model uh, with entry rather than tell you like, you know, in words what these equations mean. Let me simply point out here, there is the equilibrium response of entry under flexible prices. So these indices are ent endogenous entry flexible prices, no entry flexible prices, no entry sticky, entry sticky prices. Notice that, so this is a standard expression for the number of firms under free entry and, and flexible prices. 
And there is this, this expression here, there is a one over theta. And if you go to a similar expression for sticky prices, you see that there is not a one over theta in front of it, okay? So in other words, if you take the derivative with respect to TFP, the derivative here is theta times larger. So that's our first proposition, which is that the response of entry under sticky prices is theta times the response of entry under flexible prices. And this is what we call the entry exit multiplier. And the intuition for this is very simple. Suppose that there is a negative TFP shock. Now under flexible prices, prices go up. Why do they go up? Because when TFP goes down, remember the marginal cost is W divided by A, marginal cost goes up. If marginal cost goes up, you want to increase your price, you increase your price, but there is also some exit and there is some exit because of it's a negative TFP shock. Okay, profits at fixed prices go, go down. So there is some exit, there is some increase in, in prices. There is both the intensive margin and the extensive margin. Now think of the extreme case where you are stuck with a price that's written at the entrance when you enter. Uh, and this price is now too low because you would like to increase it because you had a negative TFP shock, your marginal cost went up. You're incurring a loss and then you're gonna exit. But now because you're exiting and you participate to this end that is in the aggregate production function because of the variety effect that acts as a shifter in the, in the aggregate labor demand, if you want. If you want. So that, act, that acts as an amplifier of the, initial, of the initial shock. And this is what explains this multiplier effect. In other words, the adjustment to this shock is now borne disproportionately through the uh, extensive margin, whereas the optimal thing to do would, have, would be to have some on the intensive margin, some on the extensive margin. So the distortion here, it's a distortion that you have sticky prices and you end up with firms that are too large and, and too few. And this is, this is increasing with the elasticity of substitution between goods because then the more, more intensive margin, margin adjustment would be, would be desirable when, when, when you have goods that are closer substitutes. And we think of this mechanism as being more plausible for negative and large shocks because they say, look, firms, are unable to increase their prices when there is a deep recession, which doesn't sound completely crazy. Huh? But that said, we think that we, this kind of sticky price thing is more of a metaphor for the inability at the individual level to contract despite incurring the loss and, and having to exit. So now to plot that, though, those uh, non-linear expressions are actually linear when it comes to the policy functions of number of firms against the shock you know, for kind of, you started the common steady state where TFP is one, under sticky, under flexible prices, you have this red line, dashed line here, under sticky prices, you have a much larger slope, but it's still linear and that's key. Now, what about this aggregate demand amplification? If you go to our first model with a no entry and exit, so take, you know, C is equal to A times L, if you have flexible prices, it's easy, right? So C is equal to A times L and that's it. That's the equilibrium expression. Consumption is just a linear function uh, of A. Now what happens because of the log utility and, and the hours worked are fixed in equilibrium. What happens now with sticky prices, and this is a well-known problem of the model, is that now output is determined by the demand side. Assume that there is no rationing and that uh, labor supply is elastic enough and the shock is kind of small enough take a negative shock to TFP under sticky prices, the central bank issued M money, suppose M doesn't move. If there was like optimal policy, you would stay here at the flex price solution and you would have a zero output gap. Suppose now that M stays completely fixed. So the central bank issued some money, the money is there in the economy. If you go left, uh, now output is determined, consumption is determined by the demand side. C is equal to M over P, M is fixed, P is fixed, okay? So C is fixed at this, at this level. What does the adjustment in order to allow you to still consume more than the, given the, the fact that TFP is going down, uh, what allows you to do this adjustment is that you work more, okay? Hours go up you work more in order to compensate for the fall in TFP. So hours in this model are counter cyclical, well-known problem uh, kind of, 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 of the new Keynesian model that we teach to our, our graduate students. And uh, so why, do they, why is it optimal? It's because profits are going down. It's because of the negative income effect of profits 
on labor supply. So it's not just a negative in income effect of, of the wage going down, it's also the, the, neg the extra negative income effect of, of profits. Now, having said that, if you go to a model with endogenous entry and exit, you have some amplification under flexible prices. So the, the response of, of consumption is amplified. You barely see it here because of the calibration that we have. Uh, so you barely, but it's, you know, the slope is larger and this is what we looked at before. And this is, you know, of course, uh, you know, Krugman 1981 uh, and, you know, all the, uh, all, all the trade uh, and, and, and growth business. Uh, but now under sticky prices, and this is uh, the graph that we're really kind of proud of, uh, this is what you get. So it kind of completely flips the response to negative shock. So you have this concave func function that always lies under the flexible price response. So you always have a negative output gap, whereas here you had actually a positive output gap in response to negative TFP shock. So let's see what kind of explains it. So by the way, it says mind the non-linearity. This is, everything has been linear almost up to now. And uh, it says also mind the non-linearity because you, if you look at the first order here, there it's actually, you won't see this difference, but the larger the shock is, the bigger the, the output gap will be. So this says you should actually solve models at the higher order if you want to think about these things in, in, in this context. So in fact, this is what we do next with the analytical solution that I've shown you, we take a second order approximation to that. So consumption under entry and flexible prices is given by this and consumption under entry and sticky prices is given by this. Two things to, to, to mention, the first is that at the first order, they are identical and this is because of the envelope theorem, entry is uh, efficient under CS Dixie Stiglitz preferences. We're gonna change this later. This is in fact a result that I have in a recently published paper in the Restat. Uh, that's what I was saying before. If you move a little bit here, you won't see it because at the first order, the equilibria are identical because of the envelope theorem, you start, you're around an efficient equilibrium, but it's different at the second order. And in fact, you see it here, the output gap, and guess what? It's gonna be proportional to theta again, theta is this miraculous parameter with Dixie Stiglitz. So let's kind of try to understand, and it's increasing in the size of the shock, of course, and this output gap is always negative because of this. Uh, because of this. So now let's kind of try to understand the intuition for this. And the intuition for this is really that it comes from, from this. The aggregate production function that I, that I derived before, and that's kind of why I did it, uh, because if you think of it, the amplification of entry itself to TFP shocks is linear, okay? It's just this linear function of TFP. So whatever is different in how consumption responds to, to TFP shock must come from how consumption depends on the number of varieties. And that's exactly what this is. So if you now take this function of the number of varieties, and you approximate that to the second order, you're not gonna see anything to the first order by virtue of the efficiency of Dixie Stiglitz, but to the second order, you're gonna see this concavity in N, okay? So this amplification comes from the concavity in N, which is related to the, to the variety effect. This says what? This, this, remember with Dixie Stiglitz, one over theta minus one is actually also the benefit of variety we're gonna work with different preferences in a second. But now, if you want to think about it like this, intuition is this, what's crucial for, the, for how you allocate your adjustment between extensive and intensive margins, the thing that gets distorted with sticky individual prices is, is precisely the benefit of variety. So you would actually like with sticky prices to adjust more of the intensive margin, but you cannot. And in the extreme case that we look at, you cannot at all, okay? But this is less important now if goods are closer substitutes. So, and now as theta is larger, there is this one effect that says there is less benefit of variety. There is less of this distortion. So this becomes less important. If you take this to zero, this whole effect disappears. The consumption function becomes almost linear throughout, okay? Now, but now this theta also determines how the amplification of entry works. And it turns out the net effect of these two things that go in opposing ways is to amplify the output gap, which is what, what you see here. And we're gonna kind of we're gonna kind of disentangle this. So this is in a model that we can solve by hand, 
uh, you know, is this because we can solve it by hand? And no. So then the next thing that we do is to take a quantitative model, a, mo a more quantitative model that goes more in the direction of, of our paper uh, with Fabio in the NDR macroannual and to look at this, to look at this question. And so we have Rotenberg pricing and we have a nonlinear Phillips curve here for the PPI inflation. And then there is a meaningful distinction between PPI inflation and CPI inflation. Of course, the difference between them is a growth in the number of varieties. And then we have an Euler equation and we have a Taylor rule. The Taylor rule responds to the PPI inflation and that's actually the optimal thing to do as we've shown in, 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 in our papers previous papers, and then uh, for aggregate demand, for kind of the intertemporal substitution through the aggregate demand side, the relevant inflation rate is in fact the CPI inflation, of course, and, and that's kind of important. We parameterize this in a completely standard way. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, uh, go through that. So what we do is first to just show you that if you solve this model non-linearly using uh, global methods, Dynair, uh, a perfect foresight, negative TFP shock, minus 20%. You have to solve it, of course, at, at higher orders. And then with a persistence of 0.5, I'm not going to show you all the impulse responses, but just to illustrate that the insights that we've derived uh, uh, analytically, you see them here. So the flex price uh, number of firms goes down by some, uh, by some, uh, that's kind of one-to-one -to, -one to the TFP. But now the sticky price, and this is the entry exit multiplier, the exit is much larger. And this is kind of uh, in line with, with what we see in the data, you, you could say, or you could make it be in line. And now the out, but the crucial thing is the output gap. So the, 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 the output gap, the difference between the response of the output under sticky and under flexible prices is negative, And we kind of calibrated this so that it's, a, it's actually the, 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 the response that you see in the data. The crucial thing, is that now if you look, of course, in the model without varieties, you would have a positive output gap, okay? So now with if you have a positive uh, TFP shock, so if you now have a kind of a recovery that will drive an entry recovery that's large, it's kind of also in line what you see in the data, you're still gonna get a negative output gap. So the, the, the kind of recession is gonna be kind of protracted and that's kind of one, one takeaway, one takeaway from this. This is not an empirical model, and these things haven't really panned out yet. And we see the data still coming out. And you know, this is not, but it's just to say these mechanisms are likely to be of the essence for what we're seeing. And maybe this is also worth looking at in a kind of a full quantitative model and kind of putting it in our DSG models and so on. Mm -hmm. Florent, so, you have about yeah. three minutes, okay? Oh, only, okay. Or so you can take say, five, but you know. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought I, I, I kind of started three minutes later. So. Okay. Take your uh, five. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So so let me just say this. Uh, one one thing one that this model does is also to kind of fix the uh, the kind of you know in the standard model the response of hours work to a TFP shock in the RBC model is positive in the new Keynesian model is negative because of the reasons that we've just discussed, it's negative income effect on profits. In our model, that is no longer the case. And we show an example in the paper analytically with GHH preferences, where in fact, you have exactly the same response. Is it positive, is it negative? What is it in the data? Do, should you look at whether it's permanent? You know, we don't know. The important thing is, it's the same between, uh, it doesn't matter of whether prices are sticky or flexible and that we think that's kind of a desirable feature, feature of the model and uh, everybody can go and have a beer and talk about something else. The second thing that we look at is that a kind of all the amplification that we looked at up to now was kind of at the higher order. If we now have an entry mechanism that relies on preferences for which entry is no longer efficient, we don't have this envelope theorem result anymore, you can also get that you have a first order output gap. And we do this in the paper by assuming that you have a benefit of variety that's arbitrary, it's larger than the, than the markup. So then firms will not have enough entry incentives. So that's gonna be inefficient under flexible prices. But now if you have sticky prices through this entry exit multiplier that we have, 
that's going to be good at the first order for welfare and for consumption and for everything, because it's going to give you a, a, a thing that amplifies the response to TFP shocks. And that's exactly what you want, because there is this first order inefficiency. The last thing that we are doing in the paper is to look at deviating from log. And this is really important. So we're going to look at a CRRA, at CRRA preferences where sigma is now the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. And we're still going to have CES, Dixie Stiglitz preferences for the basket, OK? So now, if you resolve our model, the entry exit multiplier will no longer be theta, will be theta divided by sigma. The sigma was 1 for log. And the output gap to the second order will also be a function of theta over sigma, whether it's larger or smaller than 1. The condition for getting both the entry exit multiplier and aggregate demand amplification is to have theta larger than sigma, theta over sigma larger than one. And this is kind of empirically plausible because if you think of this as individual goods, this is somewhere between four and eight, and this is at most two if it's not zero, as Bob Hall said in 1981. So the condition for this is in fact substitutability between goods. If you take the cross derivative between the individual demands of the goods into the big utility function that CES inside the CRRA, you're going to get that this condition means that you need a negative cross derivative of, of these individual demands. Okay, this is and that means goods are substitutable. If you cannot go to the cinema because you are locked down at home, you're going to buy an Amazon Prime a subscription or a Netflix subscription. Okay, it turns out this is in fact the opposite of this right. Uh, very influential paper by Guerrieri et al. that was presented in the seminar almost a, a year ago, I think, on the clock. And we, you know, we want to explain very quickly why. Uh, of course, this, these things pertain to slightly different things, but let's see how we can think of this. And I'm going to end with this. So, in our model, whether you have an aggregate demand. Uh, 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 recession or not depends on both the intensive and the extensive margin, and these are both uh, endogenous. Okay, so this is a crucial thing. We could, we can also, we can reproduce what you would get in Guerrieri et al., where in, where in fact the condition, the, the opposite condition is in fact uh, Edgeworth complementarity, which is that you need, if you think of margin, keeping marginal utility constant, if consumption of some of the goods goes down or even disappears with constant marginal utility in order, in order to have the consumption of the other goods also go down, go down you need the cross derivative to be positive. Okay, that's, it's, that's it. You need super modularity uh, mathematically. So you get that in our framework. If you look at the individual demand for the little omegas and you take uh, in our model, you take the individual Euler equation that is a well-defined object and you log linearize it. If you take now a, an exogenous call in the number of varieties, so if you take the Euler equation for a given number of varieties and you say, well, suppose the number of varieties goes down and you keep the real interest rate with respect to the PPI inflation fixed, you see that yes, you get a fall in the continuing varieties uh, that is larger if stigma is larger than theta, if you're more willing to substitute intertemporally than you are to substitute across goods. But now if you turn on the endogenous uh, entry and product variety and you look at the aggregate Euler equation, now this n is going to change endogenously. And this n, as we have just shown, changes endogenously in a way that in fact to the first order with CS Dixie Stiglitz and with log utility in consumption, even without log utility in consumption, uh, to the first order, in fact, it completely offsets the changes in the intensive margin. But you can still get a, a fall in aggregate demand if you go if, if through the mechanisms that we that we emphasize, which are the curvature and the and the and the inefficiency uh, through through the non CS and so on. So it's really so it's really the endogeneity of the of the uh, of the extensive margin. So what we did was to really try to uh, propose a, a simple theory of, of supply-driven demand shortages that is made of these two things, the amplification of entry and exit uh, through sticky prices to the supply shock, and then the amplification of aggregate demand that can come about either through uh, curvature or through uh, inefficiency 
in the process of, of entry. And we think that the, the condition in order to get that is a very plausible one because it says, if you cannot go to the cinema, you, you, you get a Netflix subscription. So you want to substitute uh, to substitute between goods. And in passing, this also solves a new case in RBC controversy that you get the same response of ours to, to a TFP shock and you get an entry recovery without getting a, an aggregate output recovery. And we think that's a desirable feature. I didn't have time to, to talk about stabilization policy, but if you'd really, you, if you have burning questions, I will of course be very glad to talk about that. Sorry, I went a couple of minutes over time. Thank you, thank you for. Yeah, no, thank you for the presentation. That was really insightful. Uh, so we have time, about yes. five minutes or so for questions. So if you are in the audience and you have questions, just raise your hand and um, I will call on you. But why don't we'll go ahead, actually, so Guido had had a hand up, but I think you have put it down. So why don't I go ahead and I'll start with Morton so he can kick us off in the questions. Yeah, so um, yeah, very, very interesting. I, I had two questions. So the first one is, uh, so first of all, uh, I'm not sure exactly how this sort of connects with the, um, with the evidence at the beginning. Uh, yeah, yeah, so maybe so it would be useful just to go back to that maybe. The other thing I was thinking is that uh, like here literally in a, when a firm, uh, when a firm make, exits, it, it's a variety that disappears. But of course, I mean that that may not exactly be the case, no. I mean, so so imagine instead you had uh, you had firms uh, producing the same variety, and there's just a uh, fewer firms within each. Then I guess the this variety uh, multiplier that that now disappears. Is that right? So if yeah, so there's just room for. So I'm just thinking there might be room for fewer firms within some some sector, some variety now. <clears throat> Right. Should I answer? You want to go, Mark, or? Go, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, okay. So yeah, the, uh, I mean, the evidence, there's always a, uh, and the, the two questions are in fact related. How these entry and variety models relate to the evidence is really, you know, what is the evidence about? Uh, is it firms, plants? establishments, goods, etc. This is the models that we use are models. So first there are models that are um, models of varieties. And in fact, in these models, the boundaries of the firm are not really well defined. So you can, in fact, another way to say it is you can think of uh, a firm as being a variety. Uh, it's, you know, the, you, the second the coast of problem. Uh, you, we cannot, we cannot really distinguish between these. So I think uh, you are right. It could be that some of what we see in the data are firms that maybe were not competitive because they were producing the same variety. And so, so you know, some of some of those issues uh, will be there. I, the data that we've shown is just, you know, it's what is out there that is that is about extensive margins that that that's uh, kind of available or some of that. It's really hard to come. To come up with with uh, with uh, data with uh, data on these things, and uh, we're happy that people actually do it. And there is this this weekly uh, entry data that that now is available, and they had discontinued it. They put it back in, uh, which we were happy about. And so at least there is some, because otherwise there was a, a good level census data, but you know, like every five years. And then there was like some data, like some scanner data, but it was just groceries. Uh, so it's kind of, we're kind of moving in the right direction, but I don't think we're there yet with the kind of mapping between data, the data and, uh, and uh, model. All right. Okay, that was, yeah, no, that's very helpful. So you all in the audience are being very shy and we are just out about a time. So there is in the chat, like if you want to do in the smaller group, if you have any questions about this. Um, I don't know, Mark, since you joined us also, there were a couple questions in the Q&A. Is there anything you'd like to add kind of on the, the paper today, the talk? No, I, um, I, I think kind of Florin 
covered uh, uh, covered everything much much better than than I could. I, I tried to answer um, the the two questions that that came up in um, in in the in in the Q and A. Um, and if there if there are any additional questions, I'm I'm happy uh, to uh, take a crack at them or or, or if Lauren can. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks to all of you, especially our presenters today. It's a lot of great research and thanks to everyone who joined us this week. So great. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the link for the other chat is yes, uh, the, in the, in the chat, chat. It, there is up towards the top of the chat, there is a zoom link and we'll leave this one open for just a little bit so you can get the chat and I'll go start the other one. So great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Mark. So, so you're coming to the other chat room, or? Um, so I, I was looking for the where there's there's another. I don't know if I see the other link. It's at the top of the chat, I think. I I also don't see the link. I don't know. Ah. Audio went away. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, it is, it is there. I think it, she, uh, it was yeah. Ah, yes. Video. It's the second message in the chat. Yes. I recopy it. Message yeah. in the chat. Yeah. So was it only meant to be to panelists though? Because it's. Oh, now I see no. it. Now I see. Oh. Because I think. Oh no, it was meant panelists. to be for everybody. Yeah. Okay, I send I send it to everyone again. Yeah, yeah. Now the... now now I um now I see it. Okay, so we're, we're we're supposed to switch over to this other one. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll do that. Great. See you in a second. Oh.